Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome at this webinar uh, on the impact of COVID on culture. I would like to thank, first of all, our partners, without whom we could not have organized this event, L'Institut Français and FOM, and our two speakers, Anne Emmanuel Grossi and Nienke de Haan. Welcome, and thank you very much for being with us today. So Anne Emmanuel Grossi is our cultural and scientific counselor to the French ambassador here in the Netherlands, and she's also the director of the Institut Français. And the Institut Français supports and promotes the cultural cooperation between France and the Netherlands. And they do this in the fields of creation, of research, education, language, and ideas. And this through programs and events that help the, both the Dutch and the French students and professional to connect and to grow together. And our other speaker is Nienke de Haan. And Nienke is the managing director of FOAM, the Photography Museum. It's the best visited visited uh, photography museum in, Euro in Europe. Uh, it's an internationally operating organization uh, based in Amsterdam. Uh, FOAM informs and inspires the widest possible audience in presenting all facets of contemporary photography. Um, it's from contemporary historical and work to fine art and applied um, photography. And world famous photographers are exhibited alongside young and emerging artists. So I'm very pleased to have both of you here and I cannot wait to hear your presentations. For the audience, if you have any questions, please ask them in the Q&A part that you see below your screen. Uh, we will come back to that at the end of the webinar. And the end of the webinar is after an extra surprise that we have for you, but you will find out later. So I'm going to start by giving the floor to Anne Emmanuel Grossi, our first speaker. Anne Emmanuel, it's up to you. Thank you very much, Sylvie. Thank you for your invitation and for taking the initiative with your team, uh, with Noemi, with Eva, the whole team at the CCI France Pays to organize this webinar. I am uh, delighted to share this virtual stage uh, today with Ninka. Uh, with whom the Institut Francais has always enjoyed excellent collaboration, whether in her current role at FOM or even also before uh, when she was with the Hikes Academy. Um, the global COVID crisis has deeply impacted every aspect of our lives uh, for over a year now, and cultural activities are, of course, no exception, far from it. So to put things into perspective, I will first give you some facts and figures regarding the cultural sector in France, then some data about the impact of the COVID crisis, uh, the impact it has had on the cultural sector in France, before coming to how it has affected the activity of the Institut Français des Pays-Bas, creating both challenges, but also uh, opportunities. So I, I will start, um, with uh, some facts and figures about the cultural sector in France to set the stage. Um, the cultural sector in France represents, of course, a shared wealth for citizens nationally, providing fun and entertainment, promoting openness, critical thinking and diversity. Internationally, it is also a major asset in terms of attractivity and influence for France abroad but it is also a sector that represents a substantial part of the economy, both directly and indirectly, as it is strongly linked to the Oreca or hospitality industry and also the tourism industry. Uh, for example, in, in 2018, 52 million foreign tourists enjoyed a cultural experience during their stay in France out of the 90 million that visited France. Um, then uh, the I'll have to say that the French government devotes a substantial part of its annual budget, 0.8% uh, to the cultural sector. And what we call les territoires in French, uh, or local authorities, um, that is cities, regions, they devote an even uh, larger amount of their annual budget to culture over uh, 4%. And as far as the weight of the cultural sector in the French economy, it is also notable. Um, before the crisis, it was stable and slightly increasing with a 91.4 billion revenue and a 47 billion profit, which represent 2.3% of the total value added in France. 
the um, cultural sector, the employment in the cultural sector before the COVID crisis um, represented a nearly 700,000 workers, that is 2.5 of the workforce in France, employed by nearly 80,000 different companies or 3.1 uh, of the total number of companies in France. Books and the press employ 20% of those employees, while visual arts employ 16% of them. And it should be noted uh, that a third of the employees are independent workers, which of course has consequences in the current situation. As far as if we look into the different industries um, that um, are regrouped under what we call in French the, the cultural and creative industries. Um, the, their weight, um, of course, is different. The main, the two main cultural industries in France in terms of revenue are first uh, the audiovisual industry, which is now the first cultural industry in France with cinema, TV, and radio, with 13 billion euros of annual profits, which means it is 20 and 28% of the total value added of the cultural sector in France. Second comes books and the press industry uh, with 15% of the added value of the cultural sector in France. And then visual arts, um, including fine arts, photography, but also video games, uh, which are sectors that have shown the strongest annual growth, 3.6% um, per year compared to 1.2 growth for the French economy in general. So almost, uh, actually exactly three times. And thanks to uh, mostly to the design sector, which is growing significantly in France, it was growing by 10% per year uh, before the COVID crisis. And also thanks to the fashion industry that was growing uh, close to 4% every year. And then you have the heritage sector with museums and historical monuments that was also growing um, with a rate of 3.6% every year, especially in the Paris museums, but not only. Um, some of the other museums in the province, uh, in the regions in France were also hosting many visitors. Uh, for example, in 2018, the Louvre Museum in Paris, of course, uh, broke an all-time record uh, with 10.2 million visitors in one year. And the Provence Museum, such as the Saint Pompidou Metz, welcome more than 330,000 visitors. As far as the weight of the cultural sector in commercial exchanges, um, in Europe, the cultural and creative industries represent 2.3% of the value added of the whole commercial sector. Uh, before Brexit, uh, four countries accounted for 70% of the value generated by cultural industries in Europe. The UK, the United Kingdom um, for 26%, Germany for 20%, France for 17%, and Italy for 7%. In France, art objects are the first items of trade and cultural goods, while with the sale of paintings, drawings, and photos, accounting for 58% of the 1.3 billion in total profits. The trade balance of these art objects is in surplus, uh, which means we actually sell twice as much as we buy. And uh, I'll give you the example uh, that you can see on the screen of the stage Le Parc des Princes that sold for $20 million in 2019, uh, a record that year, and probably the most expensive artwork depicting a soccer game ever sold. Um, then we have books that come second in the objects um, in the in the largest item of trade in cultural goods in France. Our balance is slightly negative in this case, where, as we export five percent less than we import, which underlines uh, France's strong commitment to translation and its openness to international literature. The transfer of French copyrights abroad has been steadily increasing for the past 10 years uh, with a 1.3 increase every year. At the Institut Francais Pays-Bas, the Pays-Bas, we contribute to that at our level uh, with a policy supporting uh, Dutch publishers that want to translate and publish French books in Dutch. And with that program that we newly uh, renamed Nouvelle Voix, 
Uh, we have uh, supported the translation of about a thousand, one thousand French books uh, into uh, Dutch that have been published in the past uh, 30 years. Then I will come uh, to the general impact of the COVID crisis on culture in France. Um, the COVID crisis has had an impact of minus 25% on the sector's annual revenue in 2020 compared to 2019. And this figure is expected to be much higher in 2021, despite the ongoing vaccination campaign. The cultural sector's revenue was expected to rise by 2.5% in 2020 compared to 2019. But according to, uh, and uh, that was according to the first analysis before the crisis, but it has actually now dropped to 66.5 billion. That is a 27% lower than expected. Uh, Germany and the Netherlands uh, register similar figures. And I will now um, highlight the sectors that were hit the hardest by the, by the crisis. Unsurprisingly, I would say the performing arts is a creative field that has lost the most revenue with a drop of 72%, as you can see. The museum and heritage sector have also lost a lot, 65% of its revenue, uh, because the revenue is mainly derived from ticketing. And the film industry has lost 46% of its revenue, visual arts 31%, fashion 17 and design 8. The hard lockdown measures, uh, that is the total closing down of cultural venues, of production sites, as well as the travel ban, have had a global impact of minus 60% on all sectors. Yet, uh, we want to be positive and optimistic and, and stress that there are some positive outcomes for certain sectors. Uh, those that actually benefited from uh, or during the crisis were um, with an actual increase of re revenue during the lockdown in particular, where art galleries uh, that have rapidly developed their online presence, which has helped them limit the expected losses uh, by 22% in 2020. Their revenue from their online activity has actually doubled in 2020, which has helped them cushion the impact of the absence of major annual events such as art fairs. Then you have video games that have gained 15%. Uh, the audiovisual industry, uh, thanks mainly to uh, streaming platforms, plus 8%, and the online fashion instant industry that is doing relatively well, although it does show a loss of 6%. I will now just, uh, before moving on to the next part, just say a few words uh, of the impact of COVID on employment and the measures put in place by the French government. The impact of the employment on the cultural sector is still unclear, but it is important and of course worrying to note that 50% of the employees whose primary or full occupation is in the cultural sector, so that amounts to more than uh, 320,000 people, those people that live off culture completely with no side jobs, 50% of them happen to be employed by the industries that are the most affected by the crisis. So to limit this terrible impact, the French government has granted the cultural sector 30 million included in the recovery plan for 2021, plus 20 million to support artists in the regions. The objective is to prepare for the recovery by supporting creation. And that's something I want to stress Creation is, of course, the sector's driving force. Without creation, there's no cultural sector. If it is not supported, there will be long-term effects on the culture, for the cultural sector. The other priority uh, for our government is to support recent graduates in art and cultural studies. 10 million has also been allocated to specific social regimes, such as the intermittent du spectacle, uh, who are the independent performing arts workers, artists and workers. And that is to allow, allow the sector to survive even if the loss, losses are colossal and the future is still very uncertain. I will uh, now come to a focus on the Institut Francais des Pays-Bas and the challenges 
but also opportunities that were brought about by the COVID crisis for us. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, uh, French culture is a major asset for the attractivity of France abroad, for its influence in terms of soft power to create interest and to create a positive sentiment from other countries and cultures. France has had a long tradition of promoting its culture abroad and creating bridges with other cultures through exchanges and cooperation. That is why cultural diplomacy is such a strong component of our overall French diplomacy. It also plays an important part economically in boosting the cultural industry exports. The Institut Français des Pays-Bas is therefore part of an extensive French cultural network abroad. As you can see, we're one among almost 100 French institutes. Um, most embassies have cultural sections like we do in The Hague. Uh, we have many 260 campus French centers all over the world that promote studies, higher education in France and research as well. Uh, we also have uh, 26 research institutes in the world, um, not in the Netherlands. Uh, and of course, we have, as you, I think both, all of you know, uh, the vast network of Alliance Française there are independent uh, local associations that offer French language classes and cultural activities, working closely with the Institut Francais and benefiting from the support of the French government. Uh, the Alliance Francaise network is particularly dense in the Netherlands uh, with no less than 34 Alliance in the country. So a few words about who we are and what we do. Uh, the Institut Francais des Pays-Bas uh, like Sylvie said, is the French, French Agency for Cultural Cooperation in the Netherlands. And by the word cultural, uh, I want to stress that it has to be, it must be understood in the very broad sense of the term, as we are active, of course, in the field of arts and literature, but also French language, education, and scientific research. Since 2017, we have developed more than 150 partnerships with, throughout the Netherlands with prominent cultural and academic stakeholders. FOAM, of course, is one of them. Our mission is to connect French and Dutch researchers and thinkers, students, artists, cultural and education professionals, and to support their collaborations in order to strengthen the ties between our two countries, France and the Netherlands. The, as far as the impact of COVID, of the COVID crisis on our activities, Obviously, all our activities are or were uh, based on the mobility of people and their physical presence for events, for language classes, for certifications, language certifications, for, this, for studies, for research. So, of course, the sanitary crisis and the restriction imposed, it imposed on us uh, with the closed borders, with the lockdowns, the curfews, all that completely jeopardized the very nature of our activity. So it was certainly a great shock and an even greater challenge, but it also came as an opportunity to rethink our ways of connecting people and building projects. It forced us, along with all of our partners that were facing the same difficulties, to be creative and to reinvent ourselves, and we had to do it fast. So in a way, it acted as an accelerator in the development of our online presence, in particular, um, and, in particular and how we were able to digitalize uh, most of our activity. That way, we were able to modernize our formats. We have moved on to a hybrid or fully online formats like we're having right now, and also allowing us to reach um, a much broader and more diverse audience. Only events and action that required physical meetings, such as uh, exams for certifications, art fairs, book tours, were canceled at the time of the lockdown announcement last March. Well, remember, and I think all my team remembers, we were uh, in the middle of the tour with Nicolas Mathieu, uh, the 2018 uh, Prix Goncourt Prize winner, laureate. Uh, he was able to make it to Honingen, Eindhoven, The Hague, but on the last night uh, when he was coming to Amsterdam, uh, one hour before the event, we, we had to, to cancel because of the lockdown. So except for those very specific um, 
live events that were happening at the time of the announcements, we were able uh, to postpone and adapt uh, to uh, the online format most of our programs and activities. Uh, just a quick word also on the, the impact on the budget. That's obviously important. Um, it's evidently had an impact, uh, the crisis an impact on our economic model, uh, which relies in part on the revenue from French language classes and the French language certifications. As we derive more than half of our budget from self and co-financing. As you can see, the budget we get from the French government is about 40% of our overall budget. Uh, regarding the DELF, uh, which is the French uh, language proficiency certification, which we offer uh, students in Dutch secondary schools, we work with about 230 schools uh, for that. Uh, we usually have a about 2,600 uh, participants, so 2,600 participants uh, for the DEF that take the exam every year. Um, and that dropped to 900 in 2020 due to the cancellations of the sessions we had in March and in June and the, the schools being closed, of course. Um, so in 2021, uh, although we had 2,000 students already registered when, when the schools closed down, in 2021, things are slowly getting better again, and we expect an enrollment of about 1,000 students for both DEV sessions. We had one in March uh, with more than 400, and things uh, enrollments are going well for the June session. Regarding French classes that are offered by our center in Honingen, um, within just a few days, last March, um, the Institut Français des Pays Bas in Honingen, which is located on the university campus, and therefore had to immediately shut down physically. Well, our center succeed, succeeded, and I wanna congratulate our colleagues there. Uh, they succeeded in transferring 18 out of 19 groups of French learners online. That was uh, 230 students out of the 242 that were registered. And they developed in record time a new pedagogy for the online courses and for the administrative management of the online activity. So despite the budgetary challenges this caused, we were, however, able or, or first to maintain all the jobs within our team, which is, of course, essential, but also to maintain the support of our partners and the cooperation on our joint projects with them. Institut Français des Pays-Bas continued to support financial aid partners during the crisis, especially those who had incurred costs for events that had to be canceled at the very late stage. So the main part of our activity has very, therefore been maintained, especially at the bilateral cooperation work in the educational, scientific, and cultural fields. All of our events and schedules starting in September were organized online or in hybrid formats, meaning some uh, some people live, the speakers, sometimes a reduced audience when that was allowed, the rest online or fully online. Here you can see on the screen a few examples. Um, in September, we had the Film and Science Nights. That was a hybrid event that we shot from the French ambassador's residence in The Hague. It's an event that we organized with uh, the international short film festival Le, Fond, Le Temps Presse. Um, with uh, short films uh, that deal with sustainable development goals. And this, in 2020, the theme was water. Uh, we had the European Literature Night, also in a hybrid form at the Braque Ronde in Amsterdam. Our French author, Nathalie Azoulay, was actually able to be physically in Amsterdam. She was able to travel at the time because that was September. So there was a little window where people could travel again. Uh, in October, we had um, a fully, uh, no, also a hybrid event at the Bali. Uh, it was a, the French, Dutch, German project on the question of colonial collections and museums and the restitution of artwork. In January, we had a 100% online night of ideas um, on the theme uh, proche in French, so close. Uh, reflecting on how to retain, retain social cohesion in the current context. And in March, uh, we had a Francophonie event with other Francophone embassies. It was fully online again, of course, with speakers from all over the world. 
So those are, are just a few examples. And I want to stress the new opportunities that we observed uh, with those new formats. First, the digital technology has undeniably broadened and diversified our audience, as mentioned before. We are reaching a larger and younger audience. We see it in our statistics. And it's, it's obvious because uh, the, the, the participants aged between 13 and 35 are the ones that are most numerous online. For the Night of Ideas, for example, uh, which was fully online, we reach almost 2,000 people. When usually uh, for the live event that we've had the past three years, we host about 260 people. We're also limited by the, the space in the, in the theater. Um, for the Francophonie event, we reached almost 900 people when at most usually it's about 300. For the Night of IDs, again, um, we had some interviews like that of Boris Cyrulnik, the French psychiatrist, that uh, got a thousand uh, views for it. So, Again, a broader audience, audience that we normally wouldn't reach. And also the ability to work more at the regional level. For example, in, that was also in January, we held the Campus France Fair for the promotion of studies in France in the higher education for students in Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. And we had close to 2,000 participants and 15,000 visits of virtual booths, of university booths. Of course, when we do that physically, usually we never reach that kind of audience. Um, the digital technologies also expanded our audience geographically. We see that we are reaching areas such as the United States or Africa. And from this point of view, the digital technology is undoubtedly a factor in the democratization of practices and also a vector of accessibility to culture. And the third point I'd like to make about the opportunity uh, with digital technology is that it also facilitates uh, the access to certain leading personalities, high profile participants and speakers uh, who are more readily available for a 40, 40 minute interview than a two day presence when including travel. So there again, I, I mentioned Boris Cyrenik earlier, we had Patrick Boucheron for the Dutch participants, we had uh, Ramse Nars, Nars, we had Dan Rovers and many others. So which really creates a, a lively dialogue at a very high level between uh, French and Dutch uh, thinkers and artists. Um, as far as the corporation actions, those are less visible of course than our events but they are an essential part of our activity and they have been maintained online. Just a few examples, the Creaton or Creaton, which are creative marathons that we organize uh, between French and Dutch cities with uh, young talents from France and the Netherlands that work together uh, during two sets of three days. They work on a challenge to come up with innovative solutions to current societal uh, environmental issues. We had a cross creaton between Marseille and uh, uh, Rotterdam. The Marseille one was in September, so it was in a hybrid form. The one in Rot Rotterdam was in October, so it was fully online. And yet it was extremely successful uh, and their interaction between the participants and the projects they came up with were quite amazing. Um, we also have had and we have more online B2B meetings on uh, global health research. The next event uh, will be on June 17th, if you're interested. And again, we're organizing this with our Belgium colleagues, uh, making regional actions easier too. Even things as formal as the signing of conventions and agreements between ministers is made possible online. In February, we had the signing of an agreement between the French and the Dutch Minister uh, for Higher Education, Research and Innovation, um, which um, covers the cooperation, the academic and scientific cooperation between our two countries for the years to come. Uh, including in, in those cooperations, you can see some examples of our programs on the screen, which are mobility programs, scholarship programs to help students and researchers uh, Dutch students researchers go to France and vice versa. 
Uh, we have just launched also a new program, the Van Dongen that you can see there, which is uh, geared at art students. And all those calls are currently open until the end of the month, but please spread the word. Um, and we will also launch a new artist residency program between France and the Netherlands. And the collab of application will open at the end of April and will be on until the end of June and for the residency starting in November. So all in all, the bilateral cooperation activities has actually even increased thanks to digital technology. I'll give one final example which I, I mentioned earlier, the pro, um, with programs that show like good results, even increases in applications or participants, um, despite the travel restrictions. So one example is that uh, Nouvelle Voix, New Voices program that I mentioned, supporting the translation of French books um, that are published in Dutch, uh, with uh, great figures this year, despite the absence of trade shows and book fairs in Europe for the past year. So in 2021, we expect to uh, reach a level of publishing support uh, request comparable to 2017, about 25 translation for, uh, uh, books to be translated, and hopefully to return to the 2019 level, which was 45 books, uh, 45 requests. And I invite you uh, to the European Literature Night in, on June 19th. Uh, which we organize with UNIC and the Forum on European Culture, because we will have our guest, the French guest will be Laurent Petit-Mangin. Uh, you can see uh, him there because he also, the translation of his first novel was supported by a program and it was published recently in the Netherlands. Um, he's actually an uh, Air France executive who was working in Amsterdam a few years ago. So please come meet him. If he's able to, he will come in person, but the event will be a hybrid, of course. So in this context, uh, we strive to provide the widest possible access to all our digital resources. Uh, you have the Culture Tech, which is the online digital library with all kinds of literature and press and music and video resources. Um, we have EF Cinema à la carte, please uh, enjoy that. There's an offer of free access to recent films and VOD. And we also offer a lot of uh, video clips, pedagogical material for French teachers. And we have started uh, to redesign our website, which will be delivered in June. Uh, and this website will give you access to the backstage of our events, to our calls for projects, and will offer users a large number of contents, video, text, interviews, links, to go further in the discovery of the French and French Francophone cultures and language. So to conclude, um, I want to be clear, in no way, of course, do I want to understate the severity of the crisis on the cultural ecosystem and the people that derive their livelihood from it. It is absolutely undeniable uh, and the support from the government uh, is key to, to overcome this. But I also wanted to stress in this presentation the new opportunities and the unexpected uh, positive outcome that the past year has brought despite its challenges. New assets in our ways of doing things that I think uh, we should at least partly retain once the sanitary context has improved. I would like to, to thank you for your kind attention. You have our contacts here. I want to uh, point out Hélène Dou, who is a deputy director of the French Institute, Institut Français and Cultural Attaché, and Eva, who is our communication um, officer, and both have been uh, very helpful with the preparation of this presentation, so I want to take the opportunity to thank them as well. Um, so I thank you for your attention. I look forward to seeing you online uh, or in person for our next events and programs and think uh, of following us with all our YouTube, with our channel, uh, where you can see all our past events that are now on replay online. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anne Emmanuel. It was a very clear presentation. It gave a very good impression of what's going on
in the cultural sector, both in France and in the Netherlands. It's also good to hear that there, it also brings opportunities because it's indeed good to uh, not only look at the negative side, but also the positive sides. And indeed, I would like to advise everyone to go to the website because there are so many wonderful events that are presented by uh, the Institut Francais and organized. I know that uh, even though we can have hybrid uh, events now, I am really looking for a real event that is face to face because I know you had some great in the last few years. And uh, yeah, I hope to be able to attend uh, a face to face event, but it's good to have in the meantime also the possibility to be uh, digital or hybrid. And of course, I'm very curious to hear Ninga and more in, in uh, details about foam because you have seen it from really a point of view of a museum that has suffered from the crisis and from the lockdown. And uh, I'm very curious to know about your ideas, your opinion, also see whether you saw opportunities as well for foam. So uh, I would like to give you the floor, Ninga. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sylvie. And uh, thank you, um, Emmanuel. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here with you in this uh, in this webinar uh, so Sylvie and your team thank you for organizing it uh, and Anne Emmanuel thank you for your very insightful presentation there's a lot of links uh, uh, to what foam is doing uh, and I think uh, we're on the same track uh, in a way uh, we have worked with the Institut Francais for many times and it's always a great uh, collaboration and I would also want to take the opportunity to thank you for the important work you do. Because the support of the Institut Francais for art, for artists and for art institutions, I think is a great example for other countries. And this is exactly the leadership we need. So thank you. Uh, good evening to everyone listening. Uh, it's nice to have you all here tonight at this uh, webinar. My name is Nienke de Haan and I'm Managing Director of FOAM, the Photography Museum in Amsterdam. Um, and for the next 20 minutes, I will tell you about the development FOAM made through uh, in 2020, uh, the year of the COVID pandemic. Um, for the people who fell ill um, or even died, and for their families, the pandemic is nothing short of a disaster. Uh, and the restraints we are facing are difficult for all of us. Um, at FOAM, we had to close the museum. All events were canceled. All educational activities were cancelled. FOAM is a non-profit organization. We are supported by the Dutch government. Uh, and 25% of our income is from subsidy. And the remainder of 75% uh, is income we establish ourselves. So through sponsorships, support by funds and foundations, by donations of individuals, and by ticket sales. And of course, ticket sales uh, stopped. So since we closed the museum we had to rearrange the exhibition program we cancelled exhibitions uh, we postponed uh, projects uh, which of course meant also that donations from from funds and foundations were also cancelled or postponed but despite this hardship uh, which we all face uh, we also took some uh, great opportunities from 2020 and uh, i would like to talk about these opportunities and also what 2020 brought us in this presentation. Um, when we closed the museum in March 2020, we immediately started making scenarios. Uh, and of course, it's always good to make them, but now we had an apparent necessity to do so. We are normally open 364 days a year, and now we were closed. So we asked ourselves the question, uh, what are we? if our doors are not open? What can we be? What if we don't open again in the next six months? What if we don't open again at all? And our answer was, um, we are not a museum. We are an organization. And we bring photography and an audience together and we connect both parties. And that is our role. So um, we said, we are not a museum, we have a museum. Just like we have a magazine, we have Foam Magazine that's distributed worldwide. Um, and we use both to bring photographers and audiences together. And these are the two pillars under Foam. We had the ambition for some time to develop a third pillar, 
uh, a digital platform. And the closing of the museum was actually an accelerator to the development of the digital platform. In the, uh, so this is what we did during 2020. In the first lockdown, uh, we offered our digital archive of the magazine to the world for free. Uh, we are a nonprofit. Our goal is to connect photographers and an audience. And we wanted to offer the world the beauty of photography. That was our gift in these uh, uh, challenging times. And it was appreciated. A lot of people enjoyed the great content of Faux Magazine. And well, we hope we lifted their spirits somewhat with that. Besides sharing the content of Foam Magazine, we also started uh, Foam at Home uh, on our website, uh, the place where we share a wide range of digital activities. So we organized uh, in conversation with videos, we uh, organized live tours, we organized, organized artist talks. And in total, uh, till this day, Foam and Foam Magazine, our digital channel, channels reached uh, 24 uh, and a half million impressions. Well, that has of course been a game changer for us. A normal tour in a museum has 25 guests max, so 25 views, and you can only do so many uh, tours uh, in a day. The first Instagram live tour, a tour through an exhibition had 3,400 views. The exhibition was on earth, a group show about the impact of as humans to our environment. Uh, we made the exhibition ourselves, like we do with 75% of our exhibitions. And after we showed it in Amsterdam, we also showed it in France, in Nantes, in Le Lieu Unique. The next talk uh, we organized was by one of our curators who talked about the exhibition with works of Vivian Mayer, an American photographer of French descent, actually. And her talk uh, got us um, uh, 43,000 views. Later, we invited photographer Alex Soth for an extended talk through Zoom, uh, like we're doing uh, tonight, and 1,200 people were interested. And the recording is now viewed over, uh, uh, well, almost 6,000 times. So in a normal year, phone would have 200,000 visitors in the museum. And now, of course, with our 24 million impressions, so 24 million looks, um, uh, on our content, it's something we're extremely um, uh, happy with. And also um, it's stimulating to take next steps uh, in the digital realm. So in the first lockdown, we started with the development of our digital platform. We expected uh, a second lockdown and we set ourselves the goal to make sure we had a digital exhibition uh, in the second lockdown and we succeeded. From Talent Digital was our first online only exhibition. And since the launch in November 2020, uh, 25,000 people saw the exhibition. Uh, uh, that's an audience from 165 different countries. And of course, that's um, uh, as something we could never, ever uh, achieve other way, uh, 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 in other uh, ways. We had uh, actually 1,500 people from France viewing the exhibition. Also uh, a nice uh, number uh, to say. Um, and our online exhibition got two digital awards. It was uh, award side of the day. It's an award for design and creativity and innovation on the internet. And also got a developer award and the FWA side of the day. So of course, we're also very happy that, ex that the exhibition is recognized in the digital realm as a, a digital native uh, product. Next to the digital exhibition, we also started developing other digital pro uh, programs. Since we couldn't host talks in foam in the museum, we started with a podcast series, Foam Talks, that you can find on Spotify. And we also uh, partnered up with Pakhuisjes Weiger in Amsterdam, where we started uh, live stream talks. Now, in the museum, we have a, also have a gallery where you can buy photographs. The gallery is now open uh, by appointment only. Um, and uh, we also sell artworks online. We see an increase in the, uh, the selling of artworks online. And we now also organize talks and presentations online. Now the aim of the gallery is, not, is, is to help photographers sell work 
and to help the audience to buy work. So we are a nonprofit, and overall, uh, the gallery is for us not a money maker. Um, but for the, the for photographers, for artists, it's so important to sell their work. And the, the first step is, of course, to make the first sell. Uh, and to get people to collect art, it all starts with the first uh, sell. So, uh, and people, of course, need different points of entry to start buying art. Uh, and one of them is what we call our so-called so -called first editions. It's a work of an early stage career artist, uh, a photo that is framed, and we sell it for 90 euros. That's not a lot, it's a gift. Um, and we find it to be a very good uh, point of entry. We also organize, organize online presentations uh, of the new first editions, and that's working well too. And we just also started with uh, organizing online um, book events to present the new photo books that are created uh, and to bring that uh, to the public. Well, our current first editions, I wanted to share that tonight, uh, are made by uh, Eusanne. She's a French artist who experiments uh, with the places she passed through as subjects of contemplation. She studied at the Gerrit Rietveld Academy in Amsterdam and uh, in Paris at Art Decoratif. Um, and actually her work is now for sale uh, in the museum. We are not only rethinking our gallery program, but we're also rethinking our talent program. We do a lot in the field of talent development and the pandemic also challenged us in this field. Every year we organize an international talent call. In 2020, we, re we reached the uh, highest results thus far with 1800 artists applying from 75 different countries. We selected 20 of them and we present their portfolio in, the, in our full magazine, which, which is just distributed worldwide. Normally, we also present their work in a group show that travels to fairs, uh, for example, to Paris Photo. But this year, we will not make a traveling show because we're not sure about the fairs taking place. So instead, we organize this year a mentorship program for the artists, and we connect them with each other digitally. Uh, in, a normal, uh, in a normal world, not all artists would be able to travel. So it wouldn't be easy for everybody to travel to Paris, for instance. And now by taking things online, we actually um, uh, make our program more inclusive, more uh, democratic. And we have the same opportunities for all artists applying. So I think um, all in all, when I look back on 2020, uh, I feel we made it through in a good way. Uh, last year gave us an incentive to accelerate our plans for the digital platform, and it is working. Um, and we are working towards foam with three pillars, museum, a magazine, and a digital platform. Um, because we had to cancel or postpone exhibitions and projects, we also opened up space uh, in which we could initiate new projects. And that way of working, keeping empty spaces, worked well for us and we like it and um, we will keep it to some extent. So it wasn't an easy year, but uh, I think that's the case for all of us. Uh, and all in all at FOAM, we can be happy. Uh, this is basically what I wanted to tell you today. Uh, of course, we hope we can welcome you back in foam soon. Maybe we will see you in Paris, where we will be during Paris Photo from Wednesday, November 10th till uh, Sunday, November 14th. Um, and to finish this talk and to give you a bit of a feeling of walking through foam, we have a short digital tour uh, for you through the museum. So thank you so much for your attention and I hope you enjoyed the tour. Thank you so much, Nienke. Um, before I am going to show the tour, I just wanted to say bravo for your proactivity activity with your team, because it's incredible how you managed to change all those projects you have into digital and the amount of work that you did in a year time, because in fact, it's only a year time. If I hear you present everything that you've done ever since. And you, if you have to realize that it's only in one year time, I must say that it's all my compliments for you and your team. And also I think it's beautiful to hear that 
it also made some of the missions more democratic and more inclusive because I think that's a very positive thing that you yeah that that brings also good things so that's what Anne Emmanuel also said and I'm very happy to hear that and I'm not gonna let the crowd wait any longer and I'm gonna show you the beautiful tour Welkom in de tentoonstelling Foam Talent 2020. Ik ben Mirjam Kooijman, curator van deze tentoonstelling. En um, wat we hier presenteren zijn 19 extreem talentvolle kunstenaars die zich bezighouden met fotografie. Het is een tentoonstelling die voort is gekomen uit onze Talent Call. Ieder jaar organiseert Foam een oproep aan fotografen over de hele wereld om hun werk in te sturen. En er is eigenlijk maar één regel, namelijk dat je onder de 35 jaar moet zijn. Wat het vervolgens oplevert is dat er in alle genres van de fotografie werk naar ons toe wordt gestuurd. Uh, van deze editie waren er um, 1619 fotografen die werk hebben ingestuurd uit 69 verschillende landen. En daar hebben wij een selectie uitgemaakt van 19 extreem talentvolle kunstenaars die um, met hun werk iets willen zeggen over uh, identiteitskwesties die spelen. Um, ze bevragen ook het medium fotografie vaak via hun werk. Dus ze werken met het medium, maar ze bekritiseren het vaak ook. En uh, wat het oplevert is een heel dynamische, spannende tentoonstelling met fotografen van wie wij denken dat die echt toonaangevend gaan zijn voor de toekomst van de fotografie. Guan Yu Xu is een Chinese kunstenaar die um, woonachtig en werkzaam is in de Verenigde Staten. Maar um, uiteraard ging hij meerdere malen terug naar China om zijn ouders te bezoeken. En deze grote foto hier is eigenlijk zo'n moment dat hij dus uh, weer bij zijn ouders op bezoek was. Maar dat zijn ouders even van huis waren. En uh, helaas voor hem draagt Guan Yu Xu een groot geheim met zich mee, voor zijn ouders althans. Namelijk dat hij homoseksueel is. En op momenten dat zijn ouders dus even van huis waren, is hij een hele huis gaan behangen. Iedere keer weer een andere kamer. Zoals je ziet, overal hangen plaatjes en beelden. We zien hier zelfs een foto van hemzelf. Het zijn foto's die hij heeft gemaakt van... Uh, hem en, en homoseksuele, homoseksuele vrienden van hem in hun huizen. Het zijn foto's die hij heeft verzameld uit uh, tijdschriften, um, uh, ook landschapsfoto's. Eigenlijk een heel universum uh, dat zijn wereld beslaat, waarin zijn homoseksuele geaardheid uh, tot uiting kan komen, maar wat hij dus niet durft te vertellen aan zijn ouders. Dus Eigenlijk is deze um, interventie is heel tijdelijk. Hij beplakt het, hij maakt er een foto van en voor eventjes heeft hij um, die heteronormatieve norm die zijn ouders hem opleggen uh, in de plek waar hij is opgegroeid, neemt hij heel even over. Uh, maar voordat zijn ouders weer thuis komen, haalt hij weer alles van de muur en bergt hij het op. Dus... Het is, het is een soort performance, het is een soort actie om zichzelf um, en zijn, zijn leefwereld tot uiting te brengen. Maar tegelijkertijd is het maar van een heel tijdelijke aard. En verstopt hij het weer voordat zijn ouders het, uh, het, het zelfs maar kunnen zien of opmerken. Het werk van Luther Konadu is een beetje alsof je bij hem in de kunstenaarstudio stapt. Uh, zijn werk komt heel schetsmatig over, alsof hij eigenlijk nog bezig is geweest om een compositie te maken. Um, en tegelijkertijd is dit juist precies um, uh, wat hij wil laten zien, de constructie van beeld. Um, we zien namelijk tapejes, uh, beelden die een ander beeld overlappen... En um, daardoor laat hij ons echt twee keer kijken naar de portretten die hij maakt. En de mensen in zijn foto's zijn vooral uh, vrienden en kennissen van hem. Die eigenlijk 
ja, het lijkt alsof ze eigenlijk gewoon een beetje komen chillen in de studio. Uh, en um, ja, het, het, het heeft iets heel relaxed. En tegelijkertijd um, is denk ik het, het, de boodschap die Luther wil overbrengen met zijn werk best wel serieus. Want het zijn vooral uh, mensen van kleur die we in zijn foto's zien. En... Um, als we kijken naar de geschiedenis van de fotografie, zijn het vaak mensen die uh, ondervertegenwoordigd zijn in beeld of geen zeggenschap hadden over de beelden die van hen gemaakt werden. Um, het is alsof zijn werk eigenlijk een tegenreactie wil zijn op die um, uh, ja, duistere geschiedenis van het fotografische medium. Het zijn namelijk een stuk voor stuk jonge mensen die recht in de camera kijken. Dus als wij als toeschouwer naar die foto's kijken, worden wij direct ook weer terug aangekeken. En een ander element in veel van zijn foto's is de camera zelf. Uh, vaak heeft hij gefotografeerd in een spiegel, waardoor de camera zijn eigen reflectie vastlegt. Wat een beeld oplevert, dat lijkt alsof wij als toeschouwer ook worden gefotografeerd. Dus er is hier een soort ja, nou ja, machtsspel gaande haast. Um, wie heeft hier de controle, wie creëert hier het beeld en wie stuurt onze blik. Kortom, eigenlijk wat Luther Conado doet is hij, hij speelt met het genre van portretfotografie. Je ziet iedere keer in zijn foto's net een soort kleine verschuiving waardoor we ook net weer een ander beeld hebben van degene die geportretteerd wordt. En wat dat wil zeggen is dat um, het beeld wat van iemand gecreëerd wordt is heel subjectief. En dat is iets wat hij wil laten zien op een, uh, een heel inventieve en creatieve manier. De Italiaanse fotograaf Camillo Pascarelli is al heel lang bezig met Kashmir. Kashmir is eigenlijk een, een vallei uh, tussen uh, India en Pakistan. En al sinds 1947 een uh, betwist gebied wat in constante staat van conflict uh, zich begeeft. En um, uh, Kashmir is, is eigenlijk al heel lang aan het strijden om onafhankelijkheid. En um, Camilo is er eigenlijk naartoe gegaan um, vanuit een antropologische interesse en is vervolgens begonnen met heel veel fotojournalistieke projecten over het gebied. Maar op een gegeven moment had hij het gevoel dat, dat op die objectieve manier van op zoek gaan naar informatie niet helemaal meer voor hem werkte. Hij wilde iets anders uitdrukken over wat hij daar zag. Uh, de serie die hij heeft gemaakt, Monsoons Never Cross the Mountains, heeft hij um, gefotografeerd vanuit het perspectief van kinderen. Uh, dat levert heel poëtische beelden op, waarin we soms ook niet helemaal begrijpen wat we zien. Dit is hoe Camilo zich voorstelt dat het voor kinderen moet zijn om in zo'n conflictgebied op te groeien. Dat je eigenlijk nauwelijks begrijpt waarom al het geweld zich afspeelt. Waarom die wereld is zoals die is. Waar dat conflict over gaat. En tegelijkertijd is het, kennen ze geen andere realiteit. Dus sommige beelden zijn heel speels en tegelijkertijd best wel rauw. Um, omdat... De realiteit van conflict uh, tegelijkertijd met kinderlijke fantasie samenkomt. Uh, dus dat, dat creëert een hele, um, uh, een hele poëtische verhaallijn. Wat schuil gaat achter al deze um, uh, dromerige beelden, is wel echt een realiteit waarin heel veel mensen hun leven hebben gegeven voor die onafhankelijkheidsstrijd. En dat waarschijnlijk heel veel van deze kinderen ook uh, hun ouders zijn verloren. En uh, dus die constante aanwezigheid van de dood, bedoel, sommige foto's zien we op kogelgaten, uh, dat soort dingen, die um, zit op verschillende manieren in deze serie. Dus de dood zit in al die foto's, maar ook deze kaartjes, dat zijn kaartjes die uh, in Kashmir op straat verkocht worden door straatverkopers van Soefie heiligen. Dat is uh, um, uh, een, een gebruikelijke verering van dode heiligen in de Kashmiri cultuur. Maar um, verwijst ook een beetje naar dat de martelaren in de onafhankelijkheidsstrijd misschien wel de nieuwe heiligen zijn geworden in, in de hedendaagse samenleving van Kashmir.
Ik sta nu voor het werk van Aji J, een Italiaanse Senegalese fotografe. En zij um, is eigenlijk aan de slag gegaan met het um, Maggi bouillonblokje. Iets wat we allemaal kennen, maar wat zij steeds tegenkwam op een reis door West-Afrika, terwijl ze van, uh, door Senegal reisde en Mauritanië en Mali. En daar iedere keer reclame tegenkwam van de uh, Magic Cube, het Maggi bouillonblokje. Um, maar op een manier die... Um, wat ze eigenlijk gewoon vreemd vond, is dat het wordt als een traditioneel product aan de, aan de man gebracht. Of eigenlijk aan de vrouw, want echt met slogans zoals... With Magic Cube, every woman could be a star. En, uh, en tegelijkertijd is het helemaal niet zo'n traditioneel product. Want het neemt traditionele um, kruiden uit de Senegalese keuken... Uh, en wordt vervangen door datzelfde universele bouillonblokje. Dus... Um, ze raakte geïnteresseerd in zo'n zo Europees product. Ze verwijst ook naar een ander bouillonblokje, Jumbo, wat sp van Spaanse origine is. En um, uh, ze gaat eigenlijk onderzoeken wat, wat betekent zo'n product wat hier is geïmporteerd. Eigenlijk als um, um, iets wat, wat traditionele uh, waarden ondermijnt. En... Um, wat doet het eigenlijk met de cultuur? En de manier waarop ze dat probeert te, te visualiseren... dus bijvoorbeeld met de kleuren... Um, maar ook door um, vrouwen eigenlijk een masker te geven. Dus er wordt geposeerd, maar de vrouw die poseert... heeft de foto van een andere vrouw voor zich. Omdat het eigenlijk, net als dat het Magic Cube... of het Magie Blokje de uh, gerechten veel meer uniform maakt... Uh, wordt de vrouw ook een beetje gereduceerd tot één soort stereotype van wat een vrouw blijkbaar zou moeten zijn. Een vrouw achter het aanrecht. Uh, daar komt het een beetje op neer. Tegelijkertijd de esthetiek waar ze mee speelt. Dus die, um, uh, die typische studioportretfotografie. Dat is eigenlijk een verwijzing naar hoe wij uh, in de westerse wereld Afrikaanse fotografie eigenlijk kennen. Uh, hebben, ik zeg expres Afrikaanse fotografie, want dat is eigenlijk een veel te groot begrip voor een heel continent. Maar er zijn uh, een aantal fotografen geweest, waaronder Malik Sidibe en Sedu Keita, die in Mali een, studio, um, uh, een portretstudio hadden. En uh, in de jaren 50 en 60 was dat. En uh, die foto's zijn zo erg aangeslagen op de westerse kunstmarkt dat die symbool zijn komen te staan voor wat Afrikaanse fotografie eigenlijk zou zijn. Dus ze combineert um, het bouillonblokje eigenlijk met een kunsthistorische traditie... en speelt met onze verwachtingen over um, ja, wat, wat is eigenlijk uh, nog uniek... of wat is nou eigenlijk traditioneel... en wat is uh, symbool komen te staan voor iets wat allerlei andere tradities heeft... Um, uitgewist van het plaatje. Um, wat ze uiteindelijk presenteert is een heel vrolijk en soms ook komisch beeld... waar eigenlijk ook een, een best wel ernstige waarheid achter uh, schuilt. Uh, waarin ze verwijst naar kolonialisme, um, uh, commercialisatie... en um, ja, best wel serieuze onderwerpen die ons ook aan het denken zetten. I'm standing in front of the work of Carla Giraldo Voilo. She um, has a French mother and a Dominican father. And this kind of created a tension in the, within the family about what Carla has been told about Dominican men. On the one hand, she has been told how mysterious and seductive they are. And on the other hand, uh, her mom, but also... Um, other women in her family said, stay away from them, they are not to be trusted. So this became a huge cultural stereotype and, and myth around the Dom Dominican men. And at some point, Carla thought, I should just go and discover this for myself. So she went uh, on a trip to the Dominican Republic. And what she did here uh, with her camera is really quite interesting. Because um, she started to photograph uh, several men that she met. 
And um, as you can also see here, we also find them in quite uh, intimate um, um, moments. And the men become quite vulnerable. It's, it's interesting because we uh, only can guess what kind of relationships uh, she had with them. And it says a lot about how we, um, um, how we are looking at photographs, how are we looking at the other, and what do we think we can extract from a photograph. Because she is creating this whole story, a whole narrative about all these men that she was with, although we actually don't know anything about what kind of relationship she had with them. Um, and um, it's funny because in the history of photography, oftentimes it were men behind the camera uh, and this idea of the male gaze, of um, that the, the female model was mostly uh, the subject um, and not really in control herself. Uh, as a female photographer, it, with the subject of men, it, it really feels here like um, Carla is kind of taking back that control, creating her own narrative, and um, not just subverting the gaze onto these men, but also questioning the viewer of what we think we can take from these photographs. And so throughout the display, we also see sentences uh, in her own handwriting, and this one says, for example, do you believe me? Have I been transformed into the character I was pretending to be? And I think that says it all about this work. Wow, what a wonderful gift, really, to be able. I felt now that I was in a museum and I had a private tour and I really got to know the artist behind the photo. So thank you so much for sharing this with us, Ninka. You're so welcome. And I hope we open up soon and there are uh, 15 more photographers for you to explore. So please uh, come by. I think this already gave enough like say envy in going to the to the museum um in the questions there's only a thank you so far but maybe there are some questions now from the audience that they would like to ask in the q a session please feel free to ask them in the q a I have a great exhibition, thanks. Which of the initiatives born during this period you would like to see to continue? Will you integrate digital initiative with in-person cultural events? I think it's nice to have an answer from the both of you. I don't know, Ninka, would you like to start with answering? Yeah, so um, the... What we... Uh, um, uh, we keep our talent call, which we do every year. Normally we make a physical exhibition like the one you just saw, who is now in the museum in Amsterdam, whom nobody saw. You're the first to see it actually. <laughs> and then the, the, uh, the first visitors when we, uh, when we open up again. Um, we do wanna keep the physical exhibitions, but we're gonna change now to a digital program as well. So we also do the exhibition in a digital uh, presentation. Uh, but also uh, organize a talks program and a mentorship program uh, digitally. And this year actually is a, a, a bit a year of testing too, because it's the first time we're going to do this uh, mentorship program and the connecting of the artists together um, and to see how that works. And if, if that's uh, something uh, the artist appreciates, because that's of course something we're going to ask them, then, we, then we're going to keep that. Yeah. And Anne Emanuele, would you like to answer the question as well? Sure. No, I think um, we definitely want to keep some of those uh, assets that we discovered over the past few years. Um, we, we've noticed that those hybrid type events, I think that's what the question is about, um, having a combination of the live events with uh, 
the speakers or the artists, maybe part of the audience, if it's possible there, while also opening up the event or the program to the whole world online is the best of both worlds. Uh, so it's, it's technically challenging, it's not cheap, uh, but I think we've learned a lot in the past year on how to do this, uh, because again, we've, we've had several events that we were able to do on a hybrid form uh, when the, the conditions permitted it. So I think that's definitely one of the uh, opportunities that we found and that we want to keep even if, and we certainly hope it will, uh, things go back to normal because that way we both have the, that human touch to the social interaction, direct social interaction live, but also we open up to people that cannot be there in person. And I think that's, uh, that will be a, a real great added value. So yes, that's the idea is to, to, to do that, yeah. Thank you. There is another question uh, for Ninka. It's about the pricing for Vohm. How did you decide which online products projects are free and which ones are not? And how did you define then prices for online exhibition? Well, we're still working on that. So we started last year. My, my first goal was to have a digital exhibition uh, in the second lockdown. Uh, and so we just made that. Uh, and of course, the, our budgets are not, uh, it's not like the sky is the limit. So we, you know, we have to focus and, and make choices. So we started just with having the online exhibition. Uh, we uh, put up um, uh, a donation um, a possibility uh, in between uh, the, the exhibition. Uh, that actually didn't work too well. <laughs> it's just a few people making donations. So we're changing that now. Uh, and we're also now making content, uh, paid content, uh, but we haven't put that into uh, action yet. So we're now developing that. So uh, maybe next year I can answer that question, uh, question better. Okay. And there is another question Solène has um, about the online audience visiting your foam uh, museum. Is it the same audience as before? Did you reach new people which weren't regular visitors of phone? Yeah, it's a, it's really a new audience. It's a, it's a global audience. Uh, it's from all over the world, uh, much larger numbers. So uh, we actually see that it's a good thing to, to um, keep doing both. We reach different people in Amsterdam than we reach uh, in the in the digital uh, platform, mm -hmm. um, and it's also uh, and that's something we want to keep, you know. Also do the the presentations in Amsterdam, but also uh, keep the digital platform. It's also a way of being able to share more and broader, and also in a more uh, sustainable way uh, the things you you made. Yeah, I can also. So yeah, it's, it's, so it's really a new audience for us. And I can imagine that this new audience online will be at some point the audience once you open up because then it has triggered their enthusiasm and they've seen it online and they probably want to see it in the museum as well. So that's an interesting uh, yeah. trend to follow yeah. as well. Yeah. There's also a question on for the artist. How do the artists think about the difference between online and life well of course um, um nobody expected the pandemic so uh, all, uh, we didn't and the artists uh, didn't either and um we planned on making a physical exhibition and then we we had to tell them that was not possible um that of course was a disappointment for them because they they uh, I thought that was going to happen. Now we made this uh, digital exhibition. They are very happy with it. They're very proud of it. Uh, it was very uh, um, uh, intensive to work with them, to talk with through with them, to see how their work is presented, sometimes also with sound or colors or text. Mm. So it was a really a different way of making an exhibition, but they're very happy with it. So um, Luckily, and that's also the goal, because you know it's it's all about the art and the artist. So they're yeah. actually happy. Yeah. Well, and I can imagine that what you said earlier about uh, it's a more democratic way, more inclusive way, and that you reach different audience mm -hmm. also means with the amount of audience that you have, uh, which increased during COVID online, 
that also gives the opportunity for the artist to show his or her work as well. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and and some work uh, um, is is uh, the development in photography is really going fast, and the new developments are all digital, and some artworks are actually made in the digital world. Oh, yeah. So it would actually be last year, two years ago, we had some exhibitions which are then challenging to present them in the museum while they're actually digital native. Oh, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's really good to build this platform and to, to also be able to keep up with the changes in the medium. Yeah. There is another question. I guess the Netherlands, in the Netherlands, most of the events are in English. How is that in France? I think both of you can answer that question because you both have events in both countries. I think, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ninka. Oh uh, yeah, well, in foam, uh, we have uh, uh, events in Dutch and in English. Um, actually also in Dutch sign language. language. Oh. Uh, and we're also now uh, developing uh, a tour uh, uh, in Turkish. So oh. we, try different approaches uh, and in the team in in foam is is uh, fairly international too so we have this really strange language <laughs> that's a combination of dutch and english and we mix it just all together and for you Anne Emmanuel? Well, i think there are more and more um partly english even some all are in english or french and english again because you're online and you want to reach out to the broadest possible audience. So uh, I think that's something that has developed as well. Okay. Are there any more questions I asked to the audience? There's not one in the, in the Q&A anymore. So I'm gonna just give you a few seconds if you change your mind. <laughs> I don't think so, then I wanna thank Nienke de Haan and Anne Manuel Grossi for sharing your knowledge, your expertise, just you know your experience with us. I hope that the museum can open soon. I hope Anne Emmanuel that you can start creating and starting working with the French Dutch students and professionals on new projects soon, also live. Mm -hmm. And I would like to invite the audience to go to the both the website we'll make sure it's all on the on our website to uh, so you can find institut francais and foam of course once foam can open its doors again i really would like to invite you to go and visit this current exhibition and also um, to register for the events that institut francais is uh, organizing so again thanks so much it was so inspiring and i can't wait to have an opening of the museums again and i would like to thank the audience for being with us today i hope you had a good webinar that you're inspired as well and i hope to see you all soon thank you thank you sylvie thank you everyone thank you. <laughs>